So this research is about alternative ways of storing data, digital data, for archival purposes with DNA. The initial thought was, you know, I don't care what I'm building, and so why don't we just build Moby Dick or something? Um, I'll just encode it into DNA and we'll just build that because I don't want to worry about the design at this point in time. Shri and I debated what we should encode, what would re nicely represent the digital universe. And we wanted something that represented a sort of modern digital. So we used an HTML version of a book that, it, that, that, that I wrote recently called Regenesis. The HTML form, let's say the web form, in includes uh, um, images, it, digital images, it includes uh, JavaScript programming language that actually does perform something interactively with the, with the person. And so we encoded that into zeros and ones and then into, into DNA. We started thinking about, um, based on some prior work, of thinking about DNA as a source of information storage because one, it, it is very, uh, it's very long lasting. You can recover DNA over thousands of years. And second, uh, it's a very dense store, storage information source. Most non-DNA methods store uh, on a plane, while well, DNA can be stored in a volume. Um, uh, the density is, is remarkably high, as little as uh, uh, one bit per base, one base per cubic nanometer. Uh, and uh, so we can store on the order of almost a zettabyte in a gram of DNA, a milliliter, uh, uh, volume. The theoretical density of a DNA is that you could store the total world's information, which is 1.8 zettabytes, at least in 2011, in about four grams of DNA. And it leverages uh, rapidly improving next generation reading and writing of DNA. The book we encoded was actually a book that George is, has written and in the book is a, is a section on, on this particular piece of work. So the sentence being shown in the image is, is almost a meta sentence in, from the book that says, decoding self-referential DNA, enco encoding these nodes. And we're able to just show um, how we take the, in this particular case, starting with the F in referential and ending in the N in DNA, take it to individual bits, which correspond to ASCII codes and a barcode, and then we take those ones and zeros and convert them to uh, A, T, C, and G, or, or DNA bases, um, where T and G stand for one, and, and uh, A and C stand for zero. And so we, then we just add PCR primers to the end of those and synthesize it um, on a microfluidic chip. And so what's shown is the, the red barcode and the blue, the blue data block, essentially that's in a larger context of other barcodes and data blocks. Um, and then when we sequence, we sequence the whole thing, um, and we'll get many copies of each particular barcode sequenced. And then we were able to reconstruct the mes message, and then we just go back um, the same way that we encoded it, by decoding the message back to ones and zeros, and then back to text. And because we have the address, we know where it goes back, so once we sequence everything, we're able to reconstruct what the original message that you're encoding or digital information that you were encoding in there. So, um, so this is a, a, a problem that I had been brooding about, thinking about since uh, around the year 2000 when we applied for a DARPA grant on uh, DNA memory, it was called. And, uh, slowly it became more and more evident how we could implement this uh, with, with technology that's developed since 2001. And uh, I got excited enough about it and, uh, that, that I went to the bench personally and, uh, and uh, Sri Kasseri uh, helped uh, me get oriented uh, on this particular set of tools that I needed. Initially I would, I would follow him around and make sure everything was okay, but then within a couple of days he was just you know, it was just kind of normal to have George in the lab, uh, which was fun. It was also fun, like, kind of teaching him some of the newer stuff that hasn't, wasn't around when he was doing experiments, I guess. And then Shri and I did a lot of sequence analysis afterwards to, to see what the error rates and so forth. But Shri clearly uh, was taking the role of a, a senior investigator, even though technically he was uh, a postdoctoral fellow working with me. 
um, and I took on the role of a junior investigator since I was doing a lot of the pipetting and, and, uh, and laboratory work. So that was, was a very pleasant role reversal for me. Yeah. There are a few things wh where we, we may or may not admit it, to uh, but they're limited by our storage capabilities. So for example, if we could store everything, we wouldn't be throwing out data. We wouldn't be writing on top of reusing uh, uh, disks and tape drives. If we, could, if we could store, say, video information over broad set uh, of the earth and then just store it, archive it, until something really good or really bad has occurred to occur, have occurred in that, and then scrape the data and, and find out what actually happened in great detail. That's something we wouldn't even consider doing today, but you can imagine very inexpensive biological cameras that could encode it into the DNA and you could, uh, and you could have uh, very exhaustive uh, archives of this that would only infrequently be accessed. Or you could imagine other huge data sources like all the neuronal firings in the brain which could be encoded into DNA and again you could do selective reading of that as needed. Um, and so on.